um, okay, we are almost live. Okay, we are live. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. So welcome back to to the second uh, day of log conference. Uh, this is our uh, second session of oral presentations. Um, this time we, we are going to hear three another uh, awesome presentations that were um, uh, ranked really, really highly by our uh, reviewers. So I think that we can start right away. And the first presentation is going to be um, given by uh, uh, Jonas and uh, Dulan. So the, the screen is already sharing. So guys, I think the floor is yours. Great, fantastic. Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Dolhan. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And speaking alongside me today is my co-author, Jonas Yas from the University of Cambridge. And we will be presenting our work, Recursive Algorithmic Reasoning, which we completed under the supervision of Petar Velichkovic. So in our work, we try to resolve the following question. How can neural networks execute recursive algorithms? And I'll first try to convince you why we think they currently can't execute recursive algorithms well, and then we'll introduce a solution. But first, let's have a look at neural algorithmic reasoning. And to give you a primer on neural algorithmic reasoning, we need to talk about algorithms. So let's first consider the properties of algorithms and neural networks. Algorithms will provide us correctness guarantees. And with those correctness guarantees, we also get correctness for problem instances of all sizes. So if I gave you a list of size four and we were applying a sorting algorithm, it would be correct for that size four and also for a list of size 100. We also get strict definitions of the input and output. And this is part of the reason that we get these correctness guarantees. And also we have some well-defined reasoning process. On the other hand, with neural networks, we get advantages like the potential to outperform handwritten code when we're learning a solution, handling missing inputs, as well as reasoning in latent space. And this handling and missing inputs comes from this reasoning in latent space property, which also gives us advantages like the potential to combine behaviors or just modify the latent space in some way. So we've seen that algorithms and neural networks have these complementary advantages. Now, is there a way that we can marry these complementary advantages together? Well, perhaps, and this is what neural algorithmic reasoning studies, how can we get the best of both worlds by getting neural nets to learn how to execute algorithms? And uh, neural algorithmic reasoning, or NAR, follows an encode process decode paradigm where the input is encoded, a processor network is applied recurrently over some number of time steps, and the final output can be decoded. So in each of these examples, you'll notice that the inputs and the outputs are represented as graphs. And in NAR, we generally work with graph representations and therefore graph neural networks. This is because algorithm, algorithms are pretty naturally amenable to graph representations. And that's because we can generally view them as manipulations of sets of objects and the relations between them. So for example, in the topmost case, we're looking at a list and we're treating this list as a chain where each element is a node and their ordering is defined by the directed edges that connect them in green. So once we've applied the processor network and we do the decoding, the edge ordering has changed to get a sorted list. So let's look at this in a little more detail and about how can we apply the processor and learn to mimic an algorithm using the example of quicksort. So to do quicksort, we start with an unsorted list at our first time step. We provide this unsorted list, which is in a graph representation to our GNN. And our GNN will predict two things. Firstly, the next state of this unsorted list. And secondly, something called hints. Hints are what describe the state of the algorithm's computation. So there are various variables within the algorithm that tell you how far along that algorithm is. And for quick sort, these things are things like, what does the pivot index say? Where's the left pointer? Where's the right pointer? And so on. Um, and so it tells you how far along this quicksort process that we are. And so in the next step, we take these hints, we take the next the current state of the, the list, and we give it to the GNN again, and that predicts the next state of the algorithm at time equals three. So this new state of the pivot index, the new state of the left pointer, right pointer, and the new state of our list. And if we apply this process continuously up to some point, then at the end, we get this point where 
we've predicted um, predicted the sorted list and the final state of the algorithm. So you can see how in training, we would need to supervise the output of the hints at each time step. And that this is the information that provides the grounding, which ensures that the GNN doesn't simply learn any sorting algorithm, but specifically it learns how to do quicksort. And so this is how neural networks will learn to execute algorithms under the NAR paradigm. So great, we know how neural algorithmic reasoning works now, but what about recursive algorithms? And notably, the example I just gave you, quicksort, is a recursive algorithm. And so does the process I described to you on the last slide really work for recursive algorithms? And I'd like to convince you that without structured memory, neural networks can't execute recursive algorithms well. And let's take a look at the most prototypical of graph recursive algorithms, a favorite of undergrad algorithms courses, depth first search. This algorithm is really simple. We start with a given node and we recursively search its unvisited neighbors. And how does this look on a real graph? Well, we have this example on the bottom left that we'll go through now. So the gray nodes are being explored, the black nodes are visited, and U indicates the current focus of the algorithm. The dotted lines um, tell you the predecessor node in the exploration path. So starting from the left, at first, we start with node one, and a few steps later, after making the arbitrary choice to explore node two first, we reach the state of the second graph, where we've reached node six after going through node one, two, four, and five. And you'll notice that all of node six's neighbors are now gray, and so these uh, we need to actually start backtracking. And so we need to know the predecessor of node six to get to node five, the predecessor of node five to get to node four, predecessor of four to get to two, and so on, up to return, returning to node one, so that we can explore node three. And in general, this elucidates the point that in depth first search, where the longest recursion depth is ON, we need memory to store ON predecessor pointers. So a neural network can't reason recursively about an arbitrarily large graph, because we'd have some arbitrarily large number of predecessor pointers, when it has a fixed size hidden state. And supporting this idea, Della Tang et al. in their 2022 paper, Neural Networks and the Chomsky Hierarchy, found empirically that they could only get networks to generalize on context-free and context-sensitive tasks when they're augmented with structured memory. So we take inspiration from this idea, noting that call stacks will resolve recursion in computer programs. And so in a computer program, whenever a recursive call is made, the state of the function is pushed to the call stack. And when the call completes, this state is restored and computation within that frame continues. In NAR, can we instead learn to push and pop latent states which carry similar information where appropriate in a recursive algorithm to, stall, to solve this recursion problem? So in the DFS example that we were looking at earlier, the stack memory could hold the state of the relevant predecessor pointers via the latent state and pop them as required during backtracking. So let's take a look at how we can add potentially such a cool stack to the NAR framework. So as usual, we have the predicted computation state in the bottom left coming as input to the graph neural network. But instead of just predicting the next computation state, we also predict a stack operation, a push, a pop, or a no-op. If this operation is a push, we take the embeddings in the GNN and push them to a stack. If the operation is a pop, then we take, the, uh, then we take off anything on top of the stack. And if this operation is a no-op, then we do nothing to the stack. And importantly, the embeddings at the top of the stack are also input to the network such that it sees the state of computation that was last pushed. And this is what's important, because if we go back to our DFS example, then if we're at node 5, then we, then we see the state of computation that was last pushed that tells us to follow a predecessor pointer to node 4. And the same applies between node 4 and node 2. So another important question to consider is, well, I just told you that we take um, the embeddings of the GNN and push them to a stack, but we haven't really described what this stack element actually consists of. So we've considered two options here. We could have multiple stacks, one for each individual graph node, that if a push operation occurs, the corresponding node embedding should be pushed to each of the stacks. This we call a node-wise call stack. Alternatively, on a stack push, we could take all of these node embeddings and pull them. In other words, with a min, a max, a sum, or mean, and place this embedding on the stack. This we call a graph level stack. And we'll come back to these design considerations in our ablations. But first, algorithmic reasoning is tiring work. So I'm going to hand over to my co author, Jonas.
Yeah, thanks. Um, so I hope Dilhan convinced you a little bit of why using a stack is, is a great thing in general. Um, obviously, we'll also see that empirically later. Um, but the, the detail that we need to talk about now is that you need to be a little bit careful about how you formulate your problem to actually make use of that potential. And for that, first, let's have a quick look um, at a particular problem um, property of, of the CLRS benchmark of this neural algorithm reasoning thing. Um, so Dolhan already mentioned that hints are basically the values of variables at different time steps in, in the algorithm, right? Um, so there are different kinds of hints. For instance, if you want to store the parent pointer of each single node, then uh, that is what we would call the per, uh, per node hint, because uh, we need to store this variable once per node or once per element, right? On the other hand, if you have, for instance, the min pointer in binary search, you only need one of those pointers that points like at one position in the entire list, right? So that's a per graph hint where you only have um, one of those. And why do we need to know that? Well, so the um, the standard formulation uh, of tasks like DFS in, in this benchmark or in NAR in general um, is designed in a way that, for instance, for DFS, what we want to do is we want to predict the parent of each node. So our final output is having this uh, having the, the parent of each uh, single node. Now, how they do that is by um, having hints for every single, by having per node hints that store the parent of each node. And uh, we try to predict that in every single time step, but that means we need to carry on all this information about all the nodes uh, between different time steps, right? Because we need to predict all, all the hints at once in every time step. And that is exactly um, what Dohan said earlier, that if we have fixed size memory, that doesn't really work. So the stack doesn't help us if we still require to predict everything at once in the end or uh, also in the inter intermediate states. So what we do instead is um, we turn that into a graph a hint. We just say, we just need to predict the parent of the current node, whatever we predict as the current node, that is a graph hint, right? Uh, and then we need to predict the parent of the current node, not the parent of all nodes. Um, and yes, that, that um, lines way better. So if you can uh, think about, uh, if you implement DFS, you don't have a table where you say uh, store the parents of all nodes. You just have, you deal with the current node and then you return whatever your result is and uh, collect it that way, right? Um, now, obviously, that comes with the problem that if I only predict the um, parent of the current node in each time step, how do I get my final result with all the parents? Um, and for that, uh, what we do is we, we just introduce basically a dictionary, right? Um, in every time step, uh, we know what we predict as the current node, and we know what we predict as the parent of the current node. No, so we just overwrite in this dictionary, we take the uh, current node as the key and whatever our result is in this uh, case, the, the parent pointer we write as, as the result. And then um, that gives us in the end a nice table with, uh, with our final result. And yes, talking about results. Um, so it turns out after um, all those theoretical arguments we make that it actually works pretty well. Um, so. In the original paper, um, if you have a DFS, you can learn that pretty well. But as soon as you go on uh, to larger graphs, so in this uh, case, we take three times as large graphs, um, your accuracy drops from around 100% to around 50%. And that is highly related to this idea that we, we can't really, it doesn't align. Um, and there is no, if with our fixed hidden state, there is no way to properly generalize to this larger graph. Um, and if we just introduce our stack memory um, in, in a graph -y, uh, y stack, then we already uh, get to 70% out of distribution. And then if we actually have one stack per node, we get to 100% accuracy, so basically perfect. Um, we don't know how much larger we could go there, but um, it, it definitely looks promising. And then one more thing I want to mention is that obviously what I just told you, if we don't have this output collection stack um, step, so if we just limit ourselves to having stack memory, but um, also somehow force predicting all the results at once, 
uh, that doesn't work. Uh, and I, I hope I just explained why that doesn't work. But um, yeah, empirically, we also see that 50%, 25% accuracy. Um, so, so that can't work. Now, one more interesting question might be, how does this whole thing look memory-wise? Because you could think that, well, I'm using stack memory now, right? That could grow pretty large. Um, so doesn't that take a lot of memory? And what it turns out that actually in our experiments, we take a lot less memory. So basically around a third. And the reason for that is that despite having the stack memory, um, we turned a lot of those per node hits that we needed, where we needed to store values once per node for the whole graph. Uh, we turned a lot of those into graph hits, so we only need to store, uh, store one value in total independent of the graph size now. Um, and that turns out to be way more significant in its impact than adding a little bit of stack memory. And it also speeds up a little bit, but that's not quite as significant. And now just some more general thoughts on, on this whole idea. So um, for instance, it has been shown that the um, the looping control for all those so four loops can't really be learned by um, neural networks pretty well. Uh, but the nice thing is if we can learn recursion, then we could also learn tail recursion, right? Um, so it is definitely promising that um, our method would also help to, to align this, this kind of things. Um, and then maybe a little bit of a different perspective is uh, we could also see our stack memory as dynamic skip, uh, skip connections, right? Because if I push to a stack, um, I have that element exposed to, to my neural network. And as long as I don't push another element, I will keep this element exposed. So I can basically go back in time directly to the last push that occurred. And that is what was kind of comparable to, to dynamic uh, skip connection. And then I would say the main limitation um, so far is that we only tested this on DFS. So um, we can you can formulate any recursive problem as DFS um, if you define the, the graph and, and the elements pro uh, appropriately. So that definitely hints that um, the method would also be applicable to other algorithms, but we only tested it on DFS so far. So I think that would be an interesting direction uh, to test that further. So yeah, in summary, what uh, what did you take away from today? First of all, I think this this really um, interesting idea that the the simple idea of adding a stack memory can actually help quite a lot. Um, if there is a problem that is amenable to that. Uh, so that's the other point, right? Um, you need to be very careful with how your problem is formulated because um, if the problem isn't formulated in a suitable way, then the stack memory is also not gonna help. Um, and it turns out, yeah, that, that works pretty well. Now, maybe the question is what would be interesting as, as future work is um, for one, you could formulize the structural alignment of that. So it has been shown that uh, GNNs um, align well with dynamic programming, for instance. So now it would be interesting to also formally show that um, our uh, re adding this call stack aligns well with recursive um, algorithms. And then the other thing is that we could go completely out of this uh, domain of uh, neural algorithm reasoning, and we could just say, for instance, in reinforcement learning, that would also give us a um, a method of learning this discrete push pop operation. Um, so, for instance, it would be possible that maybe in path planning or um, yeah, just navigating a maze, for instance, uh, the stack memory um, could also help because we have this very um, uh, amenable domain to to needing to do backtracking, right? And yeah, that's it. Uh, I, I hope you got some interesting ideas out of this and we're looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much, guys. It's a uh, very interesting and uh, cool work. Um, all right, so we've got one question in our Slack channel from Michael Galkin. Uh, it's about memory consumption. So maybe you can comment a little bit on um, how it works on the bigger graphs, because apparently uh, it's around 8, 13 gigabytes for CLRS S graphs, which uh, are of 64 nodes. So, yeah. So it's basically what about the GPU memory that you need to um, allocate for for this? Yes. So the memory consumption we just showed um, is during training. So that is um, 
multiple that that stores all the um all the activations we need to do, have for backpropagation and it's multiple graphs at once so i just want to emph emphasize that this is not uh, like inference on one graph um and then one limitation that we have in this uh, particular implementation is that the um, original CLRS uh, paper is in, in JAX. And because we wanted to use that benchmark, we also wrote our implementation in JAX. Now, the issue with JAX is that it doesn't allow you to have a dynamic size stack. So we always need to pre-allocate the maximum possible size of a stack. And all of that plays into this uh, memory consumption that is still quite large, admittedly. But um, I would also say, as, as, as we see here, like um, this is definitely significantly smaller than the original CLRS um, uh, benchmark. So I assume this the, the real bottleneck we have here is, is less on the side of adding a stack element. And maybe, obviously, uh, trading on large graphs is always a little bit of a problem, uh, especially if you try to do that over time. All right, nice. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, one more last question from Dobrik uh, Georgiev. Um, how would you handle algorithms like merge sort that require auxiliary memory per uh, recursion step? Do you want to answer that, Dolan? Or... Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question there? Yeah, so how would you handle um, algorithms like merge sort uh, that require auxiliary memory per recursion step? Ah, okay. Um, I am... Not sure I fully understand the question, but I, I'm assuming this is related to making multiple recursive calls that are going on. Um, so like in the example of DFS, when you're making multiple recursive calls, you're still pushing elements to the stack as you do that. Um, so for things like DFS, which follow a similar pattern to that, I think it's okay. But for merge sort, I, I suppose we'd have to try it and see on CLRS. Um, Ah, okay. I, I think I see where you're coming from with the the additional memory for merge sort. But yeah, we would, yeah, we would have to try it and see. I think. So one one way it might be um, applicable is that you could say by um, I first sort. So when I split up, uh, I, I first sort one one half and then the other. Um, so basically, yeah, trying trying to do this sequential processing of nodes that we um, that we did for uh, DFS. But yeah, I think um, there might be some more modifications needed to get this working as as one would like it to. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are uh, getting to the next speaker. Thank you guys one more time. It was amazing work. Um, all right. So our next speaker is uh, Andrew. Andrew, feel free to share your screen. And uh, while you're setting up, I just wanted to remind um, that you can, um, yeah, you can uh, ask your questions right in the chat in Zoom. Uh, if you are watching this uh, through YouTube, you can also use our Slack channel uh, where you can also post your questions and we will try to, um, yeah, try to raise them after the talk if we have enough time. Right, uh, Andrew, floor is yours. Yes, sir, thank uh you. Great. Screen share is working fine? Okay. Yes, perfect. OK, great. So hi, I'm Andrew Dudzik, and I'm going to be talking about uh, asynchrony and co-cycles. And this is joint work with Tamara van Glen, um, Razvan Pescanu, and Petr Velchkovic. And uh, to start with, I'll talk about what we mean by algorithmic alignment. So this was a notion that was introduced in Shu and Al uh, in 2019. and. Uh, we wrote a paper uh, exploring this further last year. And some takeaways from our approach is, in the first place, dynamic programming algorithms, at, at least most dynamic programming algorithms, are uh, literally non-parametric GNNs. They're operating on graphs. They're operating in much the same way with the same kinds of equations and so on. Uh, you can, uh, with the same framework, you can uh, approach the study of GNNs and the study of algorithms. You can sort of treat them under the same umbrella. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, it leads to architectures that generalize better. It leads to good ideas. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, there's a kind of deepening of the notion of algorithmic alignment, which was originally about um, decomposing programs into modules. Uh, but especially as you look at networks capable of learning a wide variety of algorithms rather than specific ones, it becomes beneficial to look 
more at the abstract theoretical properties rather than the kind of literal sort of first this, then this structure of the algorithm. And uh, doing this uh, seem, seems to lead to, uh, to good architectures. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing I'll talk about is what we mean by asynchrony. So in the first place, uh, the idea is that in the real world, uh, dynamic programming algorithms are, uh, they're very dynamic and uh, they enjoy rearrangement properties. Uh, in fact, you can think of any dynamic programming algorithm as being a rearrangement of a naive solution. The naive solution is slow, uh, but by doing it in some clever way, in some clever order, you get a nice algorithm out. Uh, so uh, Bellman Ford is kind of the perfect example. It's kind of the king of asynchrony here. Um, you can basically update your nodes in any order you want, send messages in any order you want. And as long as you follow some pretty basic rules uh, that you always tell your neighbors when you've been updated, uh, you might pick badly and go slower, but you're still guaranteed to, uh, to terminate with the correct answer. Um, and... <clears throat> Uh, again, in the real world, like many algorithms are not just about you get some inputs and then get some outputs. The inputs may change after the fact or even while you're executing the algorithm. And the data structures involved are designed so that the sort of minimal set of changes is produced uh, when that happens. Now, uh, let me just say very broadly, what am I talking about when I talk about asynchrony? And in the broadest sense, I promise it will get more specific in a minute, um, asynchrony is any kind of algebraic law. So the distributive law, for example, is really an equality of two programs. We have two programs of the same type. They take three inputs and give one output. Uh, and they always give the same result. And that's a really useful fact because it means that if we need to know this value, we, we have some wiggle room in terms of how we actually implement it. And we can take into account the hardware that these things are being run on. We can take into account how parallelizable they are uh, and lots of things. Uh, so like at the heart of any efficient algorithm, like say MapReduce, uh, is really some algebraic guarantees that mean that doing it this way is the same as doing it this way. Um, and here's a, here's a diagram from the, uh, the paper that kind of illustrates a hypothetical sort of asynchronous network that is kind of picking, oh, now I'll send this message, now I'll update this node, etc. cetera. Uh, so why is asynchrony such a problem with GNNs? So I have here the, the most basic form of the GNN update equation, but what I'm gonna say also applies to many of the other advanced forms. Uh, and uh, here we have a transition function applied to the node state with an input is an aggregated set of messages out of a message function psi. And uh, some, some things that we notice right away, the message only depends on the current state right now, and it depends on the whole state, which means that any notion of private information, information that's only relevant to the node itself, uh, that needs to be enforced by psi. It needs to learn... Uh, to throw that information away. The node itself can't sort of choose to only send some information. Uh, the next thing is that nodes never stop broadcasting ever. So it's quite challenging to talk about termination conditions. If you uh, were in a state where the message passing wasn't doing anything, uh, you would need for that to happen for Psi to be um, learning to return zero and Phi also learning the identity function on those zero messages. So there's quite quite a lot of collaboration kind of needs to happen in just the right way. And in practice, it's not easy to do this in a way that generalizes. And finally, it's really difficult for nodes to behave like relays. Um, it, the only mechanism for a node passing a message to another node is it has to store the message internally uh, and then send it on the next step. And this, uh, in practice means uh, nodes which are bottlenecks just have their internal representations completely overloaded. Um, so, so something as simple as a relay is not uh, very easy in a, in a sort of vanilla GNN. And to give an example of a very simple task that 
is uh, probably quite difficult to learn in a typical GNN um, relative to how simple it is, is just a mechanical calculator. So the nice thing about this, you can actually build one of these. Um, so we have number wheels with digits zero through nine, and we push them, and every time they go around from nine to one, they push the next one, right? So if we have a system in this state and we push it 729 times, what happens? Well, we update the internal state of the ones place, and then we carry a 73, and then we update the tens place, and we carry the seven, and that's handled uh, as we go. So uh, this is a really nice uh, uh, system that somehow like does something kind of complicated, namely adding numbers, even though the nodes are very limited in what they're able to do. They're only able to do modulo 10 arithmetic. Um, and I just want to point out there is a nice asynchrony property here, which is that if I am going to push this wheel, say, seven plus seven times, uh, there are two different ways I can interpret this. Either I push it seven times, and then I push it seven times again, in which case I carry one plus one. Or I say, ah, well, seven plus seven is just 14, so I'm going to push it 14 times, and then I carry a two, right? Now, this may seem extremely basic at first glance, but it's uh, somewhat interesting here that one plus one equals two. So to see uh, that this is more interesting than it looks at first, let's just talk about this in general. So let's say that the internal state of our node is a vector space. This is just an example. Uh, there are other versions of this, but uh, and then we have a set of messages consisting of linear transformations of S could also act in a different way, but say it's linear transformations. And now if we have two messages coming in, N and, and M, M first, uh, now consider the, the composite message N composed with M. So this is two state transitions. S goes to MS and then NMS. So once again, uh, we have two different ways we can compute this. Uh, we can either apply M and then produce some kind of carry, which will denote delta sub M of S. And then we do it do N, right? And get to the final state to get this, this sum of two carries, right? Or we can just treat this as a single transformation and compute the carry delta sub NM um, and, and send that. And for this to be asynchronous, it has to be that these two carries are equal, right? The total carry has to be equal. And uh, furthermore, I didn't show a diagram for this, but we should have that. Uh, if I don't do anything to the state, I also don't carry anything. Um, that's required for, for asynchrony. Otherwise, uh, who knows what would happen? So we can see that uh, if we're able to implement something with this kind of a mechanism in it, that it, it's literally more than the sum of its parts. You can do things that the nodes individually cannot do, right? Uh, with with a, a sort of clever definition of something like this. Uh, now, it turns out that this formula is very well known in pure mathematics. If But to see that, we need to uh, write it in a curried form. So uh, we go into details about this in the paper, but basically we think of this as a function from M to functions from S to A. And then it turns out we can write it in this much simpler form, d of a b equals d of a b plus d of b. <clears throat> and these are so common in pure mathematics that they actually have three completely different standard names, crossed homomorphisms, derivations, and finally, one co-cycles. And we're preferring the term one co-cycle here uh, because we think that um, sort of the generalization here, like zero co-cycles, two co-cycles, and so on, are also important. But here we're we're mainly focused on on one cycles. Uh, so one application of this is to kind of reinterpret an old result. So suppose we define a, a, the sort of naive carry law that you would think of as being associated to a typical GNN, which is we simply send the updated state. Um, we need the additional condition that if we don't send an update, we we don't send a message. But uh, with that extra assumption, uh, in, in a basic case, you can show um, uh, that this satisfies the co-cycle condition. This is a legitimate asynchronous carry if and only if the aggregation of your messages is item potent. So that means it satisfies A plus A is A for all A. A typical example of this would be max, right? Max of A and A is, is A. Uh, and 
Uh, this was known that sort of max is better than sum for algorithmic tasks uh, because the algorithms themselves use things kind of like max. Uh, but this is a sort of different take on it. Um, we're, what we get from item potence is kind of resilience to over broadcasting. If we send the same thing a bunch of times, that's the same as just sending it once. So we get this asynchrony type robustness uh, directly uh, out of out of item potence, but this is not the only way that we could get this type of um, uh, of robustness. And then a quick other application I wanted to mention is what happens if we don't update the state but just carry anyway? Well, then it turns out that the cocycle condition just uh, simplifies to the condition of being a linear map. Uh, and this is exactly the condition to be asynchronous um, along edges. That is to say for the message function, psi to be asynchronous. Uh, and that gives a really nice interpretation that edges are just nodes with no state. So we have the sort of same theory describing both edges and nodes, which is a nice property. So um, the experiments that we did here were basically we implemented sort of three increasing levels of asynchrony. Um, starting with a vanilla sum GNN and then a max max GNN, which as I described is guaranteed uh, to have this carry asynchrony. And then we also added one with edge asynchronously. And there we have two inputs to the edges. So we use bilinear edges as a generalization of, of linear edges. And bilinearity is just linearity on the tensor product. So it's fine. Um, and <clears throat> generally, I mean, as expected, the sum GNN did terribly. But we also saw some improvement from the uh, bilinear uh, version, which, by the way, we used here a smooth approximation to max, namely log sum max. Uh, and I'll just conclude with some nice little link uh, of this work, which is that if you think about this in the situation where everything is differentiable, so for example, a Lie group acting on a manifold, uh, so that everything is compatible with gradient descent and so on, um, it turns out that these constructions are already being used in geometric deep learning, the theory of equivariant uh, convolutions and things like that. In fact, G invariant functions are exactly zero co-cycles as it turns out. So we can see this carry equation as a form of geometric invariance, but like a higher order form somehow. So this is seems like an interesting connection to be made here. Uh, and uh, that's it for now. I hope that this was uh, useful to some of you, and I'm uh, interested to hear your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a really cool talk. Um, I should say that uh, I am a bit new to this topic, so probably my question can be uh, very silly. <laughs> but um, uh, in the end, you you mentioned the connection between this um, like zero cycles um, uh, terminology and, for example, equivariance in uh, geometric deep learning. Um, what I also wanted to ask is um, basically you also mentioned this uh, Bellman port algorithm in the beginning as an example of this uh, asyn uh, asynchrony um, problem, sort of, right? That doesn't really depend on the order, uh, or there can be many different uh, solutions for this or ways of solving this problem, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, is there any connection between, for instance, uh, permutation equivalence of graph neural networks? Um, and um, the asynchrony of the problem for that exists for some graph problems, like uh, Bellman, uh, Bellman Ford algorithm. Mm. Uh, well, so certainly uh, in terms of the the different messages coming in, permutation invariance uh, basically means that your monoid is commutative, that that your messages, uh, you know, that A B is the same as B A. Um, in terms of permutation and variance of like the nodes in a graph, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to think of that in the context of this work because that's kind of a global property. And we're most of what we're saying is really zoomed down into like one node and how the one node works. So you can think about permutation and variance of the edges and that's commutativity, but I'm not sure about the, the whole graph, if that makes sense. I see. Okay, um, thank you very much. It was really cool. Um, so I think that we can slowly move to the next speaker, to our final speaker in this session, um, Christopher. Um, I think you can st 
start sharing um, your screen. But first, Andrew should, I guess, stop. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all Can right. You see it? Yes, perfect. Shall I just start or? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, please, uh, you, you, you can start. All right, thank you. Uh, so the title of my talk is WL Meet VC, the Generalization Abilities of Graph Neural Networks. And um, I guess like the first part of the title is a little bit cryptic. So let's analyze uh, the title a little bit. Um, and let me maybe start with graph neural networks. I mean, of course, I'm here at log and everybody knows what a graph neural network is, but just let me quickly introduce it to kind of uh, set the scene and also introduce some notation. Right, so uh, what a message passing graph neural networks again. So you have given a graph, uh, for example, here on, um, on five vertices. And for each node, you want to compute a vectorial representation, a feature. Right, and let's assume you want to compute um, or update the feature of the vertex v4. So what does a GNN do? Well, it kind of aggregates the vectorial representations, the features of the neighbors um, to get a new representation for the vertex v4. And one way of doing this is by, by sum aggregation, right? So you sum up um, the features of the neighbors component-wise, and then you apply a linear mapping. So W2 is a D times D matrix of, of parameters that you optimize. And then you add this back to the previous representation of the vertex V. You might as, as well apply a linear mapping here. And then you feed this into a nonlinearity, a ReLU function, or a sigmoid or so on, applied point points, right? And you can also uh, generalize this. So you can uh, replace the inner and the outer sum from the previous layer by arbitrary differentiable functions, uh, F merge and F aggregate. And this is usually uh, the GNN layer we uh, analyze in theory, and this is also the most uh, general GNN layer. Okay, and then we all know that uh, the expressivity of GNNs is limited. So any possible GNN architecture, so any instantiation of F merge and F aggregate misses crucial patterns in the data. Right, so here you see a simple example, a molecular example, uh, two graphs, two molecular graphs, bicyclopentyl and decaline, and they cannot be uh, differentiated by, by any possible GNN. So any possible GNN will compute uh, the same features for these two molecules. Okay, so why is this the case? Um, this depends, or um, this result was shown by using um, the one-dimensional weisweiler Lehman algorithm, which was invented by these two gentlemen, Weisweiler and Lehman, who were um, two Soviet or Russian mathematicians and who tried to solve the graph isomorphism uh, somewhere in the 60s. And they invented this, this algorithm called one-dimensional weisweiler Lehman algorithm, which is a very simple heuristic for the graph isomorphism problem. Um, the basic idea is that in each iteration, you color or partition the set of vertices. And the partitioning or the coloring rule here is that two vertices get identical colors if their colored neighborhoods are identical. All right, so let me give you a quick example. So here you see, here you see two graphs, G1 and G2. And initially, all nodes have the same color, uh, namely gray. And then in the next iteration, this changes. For example, this one gets green and this one gets green as well, simply because uh, this one has three gray neighbors as well as this one. And then in the next iteration, this changes. For example, this one gets purple and this one gets, uh, let's say, olive green. And this is simply because this one has one red neighbor and this one has two red neighbors, right? And then after each iteration, you simply count how often each color occurs. And you get this uh, color count uh, feature vector for each graph. And if at some point these vectors are not equal, you know that the graphs are non-isomorphic, right? So here you know that the graphs are obviously non-isomorphic. And then a couple of years ago, there were these uh, nice results uh, connecting the 1WL and uh, the expressive power of GNNs. Uh, so they were basically two, uh, two results. The first one showed that GNNs cannot be more expressive than the 1WL 
in terms of distinguishing non-isomorphic graphs. So if you know that one WL cannot distinguish a pair of graphs, either, either on the vertex or graph level, then there cannot exist the GNN architecture that does so. Right, so in some uh, sense, uh, the one WL is a hard upper bound for any possible GNN. And then more on the positive side, um, me and my collaborators and also Shu et al were able to show that there exists a GNN architecture and corresponding parameter or weight assignments such that it has the same power as the one WL, right? So you can kind of view GNNs as some kind of continuous or differentiable version of the one WL, right? And then kind of, uh, building on this results, there appeared many papers that kind of try to overcome the limitations of the 1WL uh, and by that the limitations of GNNs, right? For example, based on uh, the KWL, which is a generalization of the 1WL or subgraph counts and so on. And uh, we actually wrote a survey about this, um, Weisfeld and Lehmann go machine learning. The story so far where we kind of summarize the state of the art. So. If you're interested, um, uh, check this out. But but once in a while, I kind of talk about this connection between GNNs and this kind of very combinatorial algorithm, the one WL. People ask me, well, Chris, are you actually trying to solve the graph isomorphism problem, or what does the 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 one WL actually has to do with machine learning? Because obviously, machine learning, as we all know, is not only about um, expressivity, so what kind of permutation and variant functions of a graph we can represent, but actually what is more important is generalization, right? So maybe to make this a little bit more precise, um, in this recent work, oops, sorry, um, WL meet BC, which we presented at ICML, we kind of try to precisely understand, uh, try to understand how generalization and expressivity or how generalization and graph structure are precisely related. And to that, oops, sorry about this. And to that, we have to um, have to meet uh, VC. Um, so, right, so we already uh, got to know uh, uh, two Russians, namely Weisfala and Lehmann. And now we have to meet Vapnik and Chevonenkes. And uh, I guess many of you know uh, Vapnik and Chevonenkes for developing VC dimension theory and by that outlining uh, or kind of starting statistical learning theory. Right? So Vapnik and Chevonenkes developed VC dimension theory. And here we extend basically VC dimension theory to, to GNMs. So, what does this mean? So we have a class of GNNs, so a class of permutation invariant functions over graphs, and we have a set of graphs X. And then we say that, oh, sorry about this. Then we say that the VC dimension of the class C of GNNs with regard to X is the maximal number of, of, of number M of graphs G1 to GM in X that can be shattered by our class C. So what do we mean, what do we mean by shattered here? So here the graphs G, G1 to GM are shattered. If basically the class C can represent any possible binary pattern, any possible classification pattern um, over these M graphs, right? And in order to do so, we kind of need to um, map the continuous output of the GNN to zero and one. And we do this by by fresh by by some thresholding. So we fix some uh, threshold, two thirds. And if the output of the GNN is greater than two thirds, we we map the output of the GNN to uh, one and otherwise to zero. And these uh, thresholds, two thirds and one third, they're completely arbitrary. So you could also pick I don't know, uh, 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4, right? And the nice thing is if you can upper or lower bound the VC dimension of a class of GNNs, you directly get a bound on the generalization error um, of, your, of your GNN, right? So the, so the difference between the test and the train error. And the test and the train error only depends on the number of training samples and your VC dimension, 
So if you can bound the VC dimension, you directly get um, insights into the generalization properties of your class of GNNs, right? And that's what we basically did. And we did this in uh, two regimes or in two settings, the uniform and the non-uniform setting. So non-uniform means that we assume an upper bound on the number of vertices uh, on our set of graphs. And uniform means that we do not have such bound. So the graphs can be of arbitrary size. Um, so first of all, let's look at the, at the non-uniform setting. So we assume that we have an upper bound for the number of vertices. And then we essentially showed that the VC dimension is lower and upper bounded by this quantity, MNDL, which is basically the number of graphs one WL can distinguish after L rounds, after L iterations. And the interesting thing here is that we were not only able to prove an upper bound, we were also prove, were able to prove a lower bound. And this is kind of the first lower bound for the VC dimension of GNNs. And then if you uh, work in the uniform setting, we first look at the bit length. So the maximal encoding length of the weights or the parameters of your GNN model and assume the bit length is smaller than B. Um, then we were able to show that there exists a GNN architecture uh, such that its VC dimension is again, lower and upper bounded by the bit length. And then if you do not wanna consider bit length, um, then you can look at the maximal number of colors one WL produces over each graph and assume this is U and this is what we also call color complexity of the graph. And then we were able to show that the VC dimension is upper bounded, uh, polynomial in the width of the GNN uh, and the number of layers and logarithmically in the number of colors one WL produces, right? And if you cannot do this, then the VC dimension is infinite and you cannot get any insights on the generalization error within this VC dimension uh, theory framework or this pack learnability framework. Okay, so let's look at these results uh, in more detail. Um, so we have a set of graphs and we assume that there are MNDL, one WL distinguishable graphs in our set X. Uh, then we show that for all N, where N is the number of vertices, D is the feature dimension, and L is the number of layers. We show uh, that all MNDL 1WL distinguishable graphs of order N, so N vertices with uh, D dimensional Boolean features, which simply encode discrete labels, can be shattered by a sufficiently wide LAR GNN, and hence the VC dimension is exactly. MNDL. So it's lower and upper bounded by this uh, quantity. And um, the formal statement of this bit complexity result looks as follows. So we were able to show that there exists a family FB of simple two layer GNNs of width two and bit length B. So every weight has bit length at most B. Uh, using piecewise linear functions, for example, Redo functions, such that its VC dimension is exactly B. So again, this is a lower and an upper bound. And with regard to the last result, which depends on the number of colors one WL produces over the graphs, we um, consider the set of graphs that has color complexity at most U. So that means that if each graph under one WL has at most U colors, and then we were able to show the following. So we assume uh, some width D, a number of layers L, and we assume so-called simple GNNs, which are basically GNNs with uh, some aggregation. Um, basically the GNNs I showed at the beginning, and we considered piecewise polynomial activation functions with P pieces and degree delta. And capital P is the number of parameters, which is basically the width times uh, the number of layers. And then we can, where we're able to show that if the degree of the polynomials is one, so if you have uh, piecewise linear functions, then the VC dimension is upper bounded 
uh, linearly in the number of layers and the number of parameters and logarithmically in the number of colors produced by one WL. And then if you have uh, a degree strictly greater than one, then you have this additional term here, right? So here you see um, the overview of our results again. So we consider the uniform and the non-uniform regime, meaning that we either um, assume an upper bound on the number of vertices or not. And if we are in the non-uniform regime, we have this um, uh, single quantity that lower and upper bounds the VC dimension of GNNs, namely the number of graphs 1WL um, uh, distinguishes. And in the uniform regime, we can either look at the bit length or the number of colors 1WL produces for each graph. And well, we all know that we see dimension theory as kind of more of a theoretical tool and it doesn't really translate into practice, but we actually did some experiments. So what you see here is, is the impact of the number of parameters. So here on the X axis, you see the number of um, training epochs. And on the Y axis, you see the difference between the test and the, uh, the train and the test accuracy. So the generalization error. And the blue one, the blue line here is the width. So width four. So we tested width four, 16, 256, and uh, 1024. And as you can see uh, that the number of parameters actually impacts the generalization performance. Um, so the lowest number of parameters has the lowest um, generalization error and the highest number of parameters has the highest um, gap between train and test. And this holds over a large set of, of data sets. And we also looked um, at the impact of the numbers of graphs 1WL can distinguish. So here again, you see the difference between train and test accuracy um, and the number of difference, different graphs 1WL can distinguish for a different number of layers. And as you can see here, like as the number of graphs that 1WL can distinguish stabilizes or converges, also the difference between train and test converges. So there is somehow a correlation between the number of graphs 1WL can distinguish and the, the generalization error. So, you know, you could, you, could say, you could say to some extent, these results also translate uh, to practice. And to conclude, I would say kind of the, the high level message of our work is that if you have complex graph structure that is captured by 1WL or by, by your GNN model, then this requires a large set, a large training set to provably generalize. And conversely, if you have graph structures, let's say with a lot of symmetries, so a lot of nodes are in the same orbit and this is captured by 1WL. So you have a simple graph structure then you do not require a large training set to provably uh, generalize. And that's it uh, for my talk. Thank you very much. Awesome, uh, very interesting. And thanks a lot for introduction to 1WL. Um, it's very uh, um, friendly in terms of uh, our audience. I mean, because, you know, we have, uh, I guess, a lot of diverse backgrounds and it's very nice to just get this recap. Um, I have uh, one like general question. It's also probably uh, not so deep in uh, in technical details, but like if to zoom out and see at the you know there has been a, a bunch of work on this one WL uh, isomorphism problem and how GNNs uh, meet these requirements, and um, we can say that okay we would like to have as expressive GNN as possible, meaning that it should be as close to. Um, um, to let's say reproducing one WL as, uh, as possible. Uh, is it correct to say that uh, this VC dimension perspective is kind of orthogonal um, dimension on this problem space that you can also, you know, try to uh, look for uh, an optimal model in terms of VC dimension and therefore difference between your training and test set loss uh, and generalization ability, or these are kind of connected. Um, so what is, what is the relation between these two uh, properties basically? I mean, I would agree uh, to say that they're orthogonal. Uh, so, so there's a trade-off, right? On one hand, you want to be expressive. You want to 
capture a lot of structure in your data. But then if you're expressive, the BC dimension will be high and you will be uh, you will need a lot of samples to provably generalize. Mm -hmm. So there's there's this typical trade off like there is in in any any sorts of machine learning. I see. So it's um, kind of yeah. And we see dimension is um, a variable that depends on on what mostly on the data set or is it also the, basically the architecture of neural network that uh, plays a role? What is the primary? Um, so I would say in, in this work, we kind of show both. So it depends on the architecture and it depends on the data. So mm -hmm. with regards to the data, so if the data is very irregular and has a lot of uh, non-symmetries, then the VC dimension will be high. But also if uh, your GNN architecture can capture this kind of structure, then the VC dimension will also be high. I see. Um, thank you very much, Christopher. It was a really interesting talk. Um, so Thanks I think, yes, I think that's uh, that's it for our second oral session. Uh, thanks uh, everyone who joined us and asked questions. And also thanks a lot one more time for our speakers. So I think that uh, uh, Michelle is taking over with the tutorials. And yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for the wonderful oral presentations. And now we are transitioning over to our first tutorial of log, scalable GNN training using HPC and supercomputing. And you are most welcome to engage with your organizers and each other on the Zoom chat or on the Slack channel called Tutorial Discussions. This session will be one and a half hours long, even though there are there isn't another event that's following the session. Uh, we're hoping that we do end on time. Uh, so thank you very much in advance. Uh, and again, please note that this tutorial is being recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel for those who were unable to join or would like to rewatch the session in the future. So if you would like to not be recorded, uh, please turn off your camera and just participate in the chat. And with that, I will hand it over to the tutorial organizers. So are all of the tutorial organizers co-hosts? Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. And I will uh, make. I'm going to share the screen. I would just like to get confirmation from you that you can see every all the windows that are open. Do you see the browser as well as the PDF file yes. open all together? Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me go into a full show um, slideshow mode. Great. And uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you to all the organizers of uh, Learning on Graphs 2023 for giving me and uh, Jean the opportunity to, to present. Um, I see that I have a, an issue with and the full screen. Okay. So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to the tutorial Scalable Graph Neural Network Training using High Performance Computing and the Supercomputing Facilities. I would like to thank my co-authors, Jong Gil Choi, who's here with us today, and Pei Zhang, uh, who unfortunately cannot be here, both from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, for collaborating with me on this tutorial. And uh, at the beginning, we will give a brief uh, introduction about the scientific motivations that led me, Pei, and Zhang to develop scalable graph neural network on a DOE leadership class of supercomputing facilities. I will provide also some details about the specific type of scalability that we are going to focus on in this tutorial. And then we will dive uh, deep into the technical details of Hydra GNN which is our Oak Ridge National Lab branded uh, implementation of scalable multitask learning graph neural network. And uh, we will uh, illustrate some uh, examples of uh, increasing level of difficulty to show how to use hydrogen NN for your own specific applications at different degrees of scalability. And we will conclude with some remarks. So, um, the reason why Pei Zhang and I developed uh, Hydrogen NN as a scalable GNN implementation is because several scientific applications of interest to the United States Department of Energy require running expensive simulations that may take um, hours on supercomputing facilities to model either a physical or engineering system that is generally ve very complex. And uh, um, 
Often uh, the goal of the scientific applications at DOE is to understand how input controllable parameters that describe a physical or engineering system can affect the response of this system. And in order to thoroughly understand this interdependence between input controllable parameters and the response of the system to such uh, variations of the, controllable, of the controllable parameter, it is necessary to run very large ensembles of uh, very expensive calculations. And this can be unaffordable even for state-of-the-art supercomputers. That's why recently um, uh, researchers have explored the use of artificial intelligence and in particular surrogate model, uh, surrogate models as an opportunity to accelerate the study of these complex systems because surrogate models are um, supposed to provide fast but hopefully still sufficiently accurate inferences about the behavior of, um, of the system at hand. Uh, more specifically, a lot of applications of interest to DOE are described by systems that can be topologically structured as a graph. And this is the reason why it is somewhat straightforward to think of graph neural networks as good candidates to develop robust surrogate models, where for a robust, we mean both accurate, generalizable, and also trustworthy. We are not going too much into the uh, fine mathematical details of uh, how the graph neural network architecture is constructed because our focus is primarily scalability. But just at a very high general level, I would say that the way we create the GNN architecture is by stacking on top of each other two different types of layers. The first type of layers is called the graph convolutional layers or message passing neural network layers. And their goal is to uh, model the interaction of a node within a graph with its neighbors through exchange uh, of information that leads to node and edge feature updates. Um, most advanced um, uh, message passing neural network layers, be besides modeling short range interactions, also include global attention mechanisms to capture also interactions between nodes that are very distant from each other within the graph structure. And then once an arbitrary number of message passing layers prescribed by the user has been used to process the input, the output of the last message passing layer is fed into an additional stack of layers that are fully connected. And the second stack of fully connected layers aims at enhancing even further the expressivity of the GNN architecture before producing the output of whatever property of interest. There are several open source implementations uh, available, and so uh, how to choose one rather than the other. Well, um, many implementations available um, open source have been uh, um, released keeping a very specific application in mind. So their applicability is somewhat narrow. And uh, uh, this is why Peijong and I, when we developed Hydrogen NN, we first came up with a list of core capabilities that we thought would be extremely useful for a flexible open source tool to maintain. And the first open source tool is a multitask um, learning meant as the, uh, the capacity of the model to simultaneously uh, be trained and used at inference time to produce predictions of multiple properties of interest in one shot. Uh, the second property is also the opportunity for the user to seamlessly switch at runtime between a different message passing policies, because very often when a flexible tool is deployed for a specific application, it is not so straightforward to know a priori which one of the several message passing policies is the best performing one. So one, the user should desirably use the choice of the message passing policy as a hyperparameter that can be tuned. Obviously, in terms of scalability, distributed data parallelism is extremely important to enable the scalable training of graph neural networks on large volumes of data. And then last but not least, the maintainability of the software. Uh, the code very uh, relies on software packages that are always updated. And it may have happened to you as well that sometimes when you download uh, from, um, uh, the uh, from the websites, open source implementations that have been released one or two years ago, they rely on uh, deprecated versions of uh, packages. And therefore this precludes the uh, correct behavior of the model when you try to use it for your own application. 
So we've all, we developed Hydrogen and N, which is our implementation of graphene neural networks that works at scale, keeping all these five core aspects in mind. And we will dive into each one of these aspects through the tutorial. But um, now I would mostly like to um, start mentioning why scalability is important. And uh, as I mentioned um, uh, briefly earlier, uh, the models uh, and the systems that we uh, study at the Department of Energy are extremely complex. And the complexity of the systems is uh, translated into the fact that there are several parameters that need to be tuned in order to manipulate the behavior of either the physical or engineering system that we are studying. And this, the large volume of uh, parameters that we need to tune naturally embeds the problem in a very high dimensional space. If we want to use a surrogate model to accelerate the study of these systems, the surrogate model must be robust through very wide regions of high dimensional spaces. And the only way to do so is by collecting large volumes of data that thoroughly explore wide regions of hyperparameter spaces, and then use these very large volumes of data for uh, the robust scalable gen and training. But Obviously, uh, this introduces several input-output challenges that need to be handled uh, from the perspective of the facility in order to um, make sure that we avoid bottlenecks during the scalable and parallelized training of the graph neural network at scale. And I would just like uh, to give uh, briefly the room to Jong to mention some uh, uh, scalability details about large volumes of uh, training on training data. Okay, um, great. Uh, so in performing large scale graph neural training, we found IO is very uh, challenging task. Uh, and also characteristic of uh, IO in gen and training is very different from the conventional IO uh, behavior, which is very read oriented and it requires frequent access. And also the global shuffling, that's sometimes a key aspect we want to provide. Um, so the, the, in IO prospect, we don't want to slow down the gen and training using the GPU. We want to push IO as fast as possible uh, to the GPU. And we, we don't want to waste GPU time because of IO. So in, in a very naive approach, we can save as a graph data per file in the, in the file system, which create a lot of the headache uh, for the HPC file system, um, which, uh, which file system. And also some, some HPC file system also provides some local SSD to have this kind of file uh, IO bottleneck, but still it, it is challenging and also setting up that local SSD and, and um, preparing this the local storage also takes time. And, what, and another approach is sharding, which is very popular and uh, a well-known technology in, in, in many uh, large scale GNN or deep learning framework. We found that the flexibility for sharding is somehow limited Sometimes the global shuffling is limited. Next slide. So in in um, uh, developing uh, different the uh, parallelism in in gen and training or dim running, it's very active research area. There are two well known. Um, Parallelism, which is called data parallelism and model parallelism, and there are many more. So, so in data parallelism, we split the data into chunk, and each process will process a, a piece of the chunk. And in model parallelism, we split the model, and, and each process will only process uh, that, that portion of the model. And, and there are also pipe parallelism, hybrid parallelism, tensor parallelism, and many more. But in hydrogen, we're focusing on providing data parallelism, which we found, which is a uh, more uh, relevant task for us. Next slide. 
So uh, uh, for that reason, um, we we did, we we focusing on providing data loading a uh, proper data loading uh, tools for the hydrogen. We focus on GNN training with large scale data, which cannot fit in a single machine. Uh, we need to utilize uh, data, uh, distributed data loading, data loaders. Uh, in that regard, we can think of three types of the data loading strategy. The first strategy is a base case. We have files for object graph stored in the parallel file system in HPC. And when we need it, we read from the file, from the uh, read the file with the data object from the file system and load into the memory. And the second approach, we can utilize science, scientific data format. In HPC, there are many uh, scientific data tools and library supporting uh, efficient data reading, data writing, but uh, still, in this case, we, we still rely on the file system, which also causing the bottleneck. And then finally, the third of which we can utilize is memory. Once data chunk uh, and then loaded and distributed uh, among many uh, different processes, uh, we, can util once, uh, we can utilize that distributed memory as a, as a, as a global, uh, global view, and we can utilize memory to memory data transfer, which is well designed uh, in HPC system too. So our strategy is using this memory to memory capability in HPC system uh, to maximize the performance. Next slide. So the, uh, for that reason, we have developed uh, DD store, which is the uh, data loading library for hydrogen. But DD store cannot solve every all the cases. If your data is small enough, uh, using the local memory is sufficient. And also if your training is not sensitive for global shuffling, it doesn't require that kind of the, uh, sensitivity, maybe you, you, are, you can stick to the uh, data sharding strategy. But if your data is too large, you cannot fit in pull your data into a single machine and you want to utilize the data uh, training, DD store is designed for that. Next slide. Thank you, Jean. Um, here uh, now I will um, dive more into the five core capabilities of um, hydrogen NN that I mentioned before. And so the first one is uh, um, multitasking. The multi multitasking, as I briefly mentioned earlier, is the uh, capacity of one single uh, deep learning model to be simultaneously trained to predict multiple properties of interest. And multitasking with respect to single tasking, which requires creating many models, one predicting one property at a time, brings us different uh, advantages to the table, both from the mathematical st standpoint as well as from the computer science standpoint. The first advantage is the fact that Multi the multitasking graph neural network architecture is characterized at the beginning by a set of shared layers whose goal is to learn uh, features that are not domain specific and therefore being general that can be transferred across domains. And the learning of general features that can be easily transferred from one domain to another is extremely important, especially given the recent advent of foundation AI models, whose goal is indeed the one of learning general purpose contexts that can be then um, customized through downstream tasks into specific applications of interest to the user. Um, another aspect that um, that uh, mul that makes multitask learning advantages is the fact that um, um, multitask learning can be mathematically formulated as uh, an inductive bias, which translates into regularizing the training of uh, every single target property. Uh, taking advantage of implicit correlations between all the properties of interest. 
So multitasking learning through the shared layers learns general purpose features that should be able to capture and model implicit correlations between multiple properties that are that are simultaneously learned by the model. And that these correlations that are learned by the shared layers should stabilize the training and therefore reduce the risk of overfitting and improve the generalizability of the model in making accurate predictions when it is visiting situations different from the ones that were processed during the training. And last but not least, there is also a computational savings advantage because multitask learning gives the user the opportunity of killing multiple birds with a stone. You, you train only one model, and by training one model, you simultaneously produce predictions for several, for several properties. How did we um, define multitask learning and how did we implement the graph neural network architecture within hydrogen NN to enable MTL? So there were several details that we had to uh, pin down. Um, um, as I mentioned um, uh, earlier, the first stack of layers, the message passing neural network layers, has been designed so that it, um, it is tasked to learn features that are general and that can be transferred across different tasks predicted by every single head of the architecture. But right after the stack of shared message passing neural network layers, we designed the architecture so that it splits into multiple heads, one head per target property of interest. If the target property of interest is a graph level feature, then um, the output of the message passing layer goes into a global pooling layer that has the goal of conglomerating information from all the nodes of the graph. And the output of the global pooling layer is then fed in input to a multi-layer perceptron that has the goal of enhancing the expressivity of whatever the message passing neural network layers did before. Uh, it's a little bit tricky instead to design the architecture with multiple heads for node level features. Why? Because the dimensionality of the node level features depends on the number of nodes that characterizes the graph samples. And for uh, general applications, uh, large volumes of data sets are characterized by graphs of different size. So how do we reconcile graph samples of different size in the uh, way the graph neural network architecture processes these, uh, these data samples? Uh, the most straightforward approach consists in uh, using, again, a set of graph convolutional layers within each head of the multitasking uh, uh, architecture in order to create um, uh, autoencoders, graph autoencoders that enable node-to-node -node mapping. However, besides this uh, basic capability that we support in Hydrogen NN, we also explored an additional capability, which consists in using one shared multi-layer perceptron that learns features that describe uh, local interactions between uh, the nodes uh, of a graph. And then the regression coefficients of this multi-layer perceptron are transferred across all the neighborhoods of the graph to produce node-level predictions. Uh, the user also has the opportunity to tune the different coefficients for uh, the loss function associated with every um, a predictive task so that for some reason, if for some reason the user wants to give higher priority to some um, uh, tasks over others in the multitasking learning framework, it can arbitrarily choose the importance that each task has over the others. Another aspect that we mentioned earlier about Hydrogen NN is the opportunity of seamlessly switching the, between one message passing policy and the others, treating the message passing policy itself as a hyperparameter. The way we uh, uh, provide the user with uh, this uh, capability is by having structured the message passing policies through object-oriented programming. We um, confined most of the basic methods that are independent of the mathematical details of message passing within the parent class of the hierarchy of object-oriented programming. So most of the methods are implemented within base. 
And then the uh, methods that are uh, strongly dependent on the mathematical details of how the node and edge features are, are updated are confined at the children level of the hierarchy. So the different types of specific message passing neural network classes only have to re-implement the getconv, which essentially describes how node and edge features are updated through information coming from the neighbors. Moreover, the, uh, op the use of object-oriented programming also enables the opportunity for us to establish new, col new collaborations with other institutions, because if any of you guys wants to develop a new customized message passing policy, then we can collaborate with you to very easily and flexibly encapsulate your own implementation of message passing neural network within the existing object-oriented framework of a hydrogen NN. Um, in order to uh, enable as much as possible user friendliness of how the user can indeed interact with hydrogen NN to construct a model and train it on a specific application, we strongly rely on a JSON file, which is a very simply structured parsing file to read all the different aspects that govern and that characterize the way hydrogen NN behaves at different degrees of scalability. The first uh, parameter that the user can define using the JSON file is the verbosity, which is the amount of output which is uh, printed out by hydrogen NN during the training. We wanted to provide the user with the opportunity of choosing the amount of output that is uh, produced because if you deploy the training at a large scale and you have thousands of GPUs and each one of them prints out the output, this may actually clog the output file where you are storing the information. And this is very cumbersome. So we wanted to give the user the opportunity of tuning up to a very high level, the verbosity when hydrogen NN is executed at a small scale for debugging purposes. But then when the user is confident that the code is working as expected, we expect the user to tune down the level of verbosity to a lower, to a lower value and deploy the um, hydrogen NN code for production runs on the supercomputers. Another important aspect that the user can define through the JSON file is um, how the data is uh, um, interpreted within uh, PyTorch geometric data objects. So the PyTorch geometric data objects are the, uh, the data classes used within hydrogen NN to process data and feed the data into, into the model for the training. And important aspects of the dataset section of the JSON file are the uh, subsections called uh, node features and graph features. Uh, node features describes um, the variables that are available in the attribute data.x. So data.x is the attribute of the PyTorch geometric data objects that stores uh, node level features. And here, essentially, through the um, uh, parameter dim and column index, we specify which um, uh, features we are interested in, what is the column index within data.x where these features can be found, and what is the dimensionality of each one of these features. Whereas graph features is uh, used to specify the values available in the attribute data.y. So data.y, differently from data.x, is uh, supposed to contain whatever property that characterizes the graph, and that is a global feature property. Once we have described what you find within data.x and data.y, the job is not done yet, because obviously uh, in, within data.x, uh, for the node level features, you have both inputs and outputs. So the user still has to specify how the code is going to split data.x into what is fed as input and what is fed as output for the hydrogen and end training. And this is done through the subsection variable of interest, where indeed the user must specify where um, which indices characterize the outputs that need to be predicted and whether the outputs are of a graph type, meaning that they are global level features, or if they are node type. 
um, if the type of a variable is a set to graph, then the code knows that it has to extract the quantity from the data.y attribute. If instead the type of the variable is a set to node, the corresponding node level feature will be extracted from data.x. Uh, we have another subsection of the JSON file where we specify the graph neural network architecture. As I mentioned before, one uh, of the important capabilities provided by Hydrogen NN is to treat the message passing policy as a hyperparameter. And in fact, uh, you can switch from one message passing policy to another just by changing the value of the string called model type. And so, for instance, if you wanted to use Optuna or other automated hyperparameter optimization techniques, you just need to create a small script that changes and replaces the value of this string in the JSON file. And this will allow you to automatically play with different message passing policies. Um, another important subsection of the architecture is uh, output heads. As I mentioned again, Hydrogen NN gives you multitasking learning capabilities. However, for every head that you create in Hydrogen NN, you need to specify um, the details of this um, of this uh, architecture. So, if the for uh, graph level properties, the size of the graph level head are specified within the subgraph. Um, uh, section of the JSON file, whereas the node section is used to uh, specify the dimensionality of the heads that are in charge of making node level predictions. And then at the end, you can see task weights. These are indeed the weights that the user can set up in order to give different importance to different tasks that are simultaneously learned through multitask learning. And then uh, I will not spend too much time about this, but obviously we also provide uh, the JSON file is used by the user to set up the number of epochs and uh, um, splitting between training, validation and testing. Uh, continue is the, is the variable used to uh, specify whether the model has to be trained from scratch or whether uh, the model has to be loaded from a pre-existing pre-trained model for fine tuning. So if you want to preload a pre-existing model, you need to set continue equal to one. And you also need to specify within this section, the path uh, uh, where the pickle file with the pre-trained model can be found. Visualization, uh, visualization is the last session of the JSON file that the user can, um, can set up. This is not a mandatory session, it's just optional, but um, it's um, a, a useful capability that we make available because some preliminary plots, like the ones that you see here, can be, even if they are not necessarily fancy enough, to be put in a manuscript for publication, they are uh, already by uh, they are very useful to make some preliminary diagnostics about whether the performance of the trained model is going in the right direction or not, and then come up with decisions about maybe perform additional hyperparameter tuning or not based on what you see from these plots. Um, so as um, uh, Jean and I also mentioned earlier. Uh, the, there are different formats that we support within uh, Hydrogen NN in order to convert the data into something that is pre-standardized and that can be pre-packaged to make it ready for data loading and data training. Uh, the two types of data formats that we support within Hydrogen NN are pickle files, which are somewhat the most user-friendly and uh, most common uh, formats that people rely on. But the pickle files are not necessarily the best suited ones for scalable training at large scale. That is why we support a second format, which is called Adios. Uh, Adios um, is a library primarily developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, under the Exascale Computing Project. And the goal of Adios is to create binary containerized files that bundle together large volumes of data and make the consultation of large volumes of data amenable on large scale high performance computing and supercomputing facilities. The user can seamlessly switch 
between one format or the other. But our recommendation is that you use more user-friendly pickle formats if you want to use hydrogen NN at a smaller scale. Whereas if you wanted to deploy hydrogen NN for large scale production runs on supercomputers, we recommend that you switch the chosen file formats to Adios. Uh, again, um, as uh, Jean mentioned, the, the standard formats that you can rely on are the per, per object file format. And this is where the, we use pickle files, whereas the containerized file format relies on Adios. And then we, um, the way we enable the user to um, seamlessly switch between one format or the other without disruptive changes in the code is again uh, through object-oriented programming. So we created in, an abstract dataset class called abstract based dataset. In this abstract based dataset, there are no methods implemented. We just provide the very core skeleton of the structure with all the core methods that we think are necessary for the data to be loaded and be consulted iteratively by the model. And uh, the structure of this abstract based dataset class is inspired by the PyTorch geometric library. And then um, two different subcategories of dataset classes inherit from this abstract class. The first subcategory of dataset classes is the one colored in orange. And the goal of these classes is to read the data from uh, raw files as they are produced by simulation codes and then convert these raw files into PyTorch geometric data objects. The second category of dataset classes instead takes in input PyTorch geometric data objects and writes them either in pickle or in a DOS format based on the type of a format that the user wants to rely on. And then once the pickle data, once the PyTorch geometric data objects are written on files, they can be used an arbitrary number of times for as many subsequent training of the model that you want. Um, DD Store can interface both with Pickle and Adios depending on the underlying format that you use. And uh, uh, Jong will illustrate more specifically the performance of DD Store on the OLCF supercomputer frontier in the hands on session. And uh, uh, Jean, do you want to provide more details about DD Store? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you go back one slide? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Thank you. Uh, right. So, in the the key performance aspect in train the performing large scale GNN training, especially using the hydrogen, we 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 found IO is one of the key performance element. So that's why we have uh we have a lot of the data. We explored lots of different data formats, data files. And also, we also investigate the large amount of time for the uh, data related part in hydrogen. So basically, we de we, we developed some uh, tool which named the DD Store, which is the data loading library designed to provide a scalable and distributed data store for running hydrogen on HPC system. So this is uh, we. This tool, this library, specifically focuses on providing read-centric random data access during the training and enables data reading that is shuffled on a global scale. So this tool uh, utilizes distributed memory-to-memory -memory data retrieval without going through the file system. Often, uh, this approach often considered as a uh, as, as, as using the file system is often considered as a bottleneck. So memory to memory is enabled by range of the library density system. Um, and we, we expect, uh, specifically employs one side uh, remote memory access functions of MPI, which is very uh, one of the popular tool in HPC system. Next slide. Okay. So the primary operation of the D store uh, as follows. The first, the process uh, begins by pre-roading the data from the pilot system. So we adapting the distributed data parallel approach. 
So data is will be divided into chunk and each process load its own chunk into the memory. And then second, after loading, each process will uh, generate a metadata information and then they exchange globally. So this is the part of the data registration process and the metadata will be used uh, to track uh, which process holds which part of the data, which data segment. And then during the training, it is to resolve uh, uh, as a as a transparent data loader. So data, once if the data is needed from a remote process, this uh, DD store will enable, uh, so allow to each process to grab the data remotely. Next slide. Uh, so in DD store, we utilize one side communication for its efficiency. Uh, conventional communication in MPI are uh, well known as a uh, known as a two-side communication, which requires a synchronization between two processes, uh, which uh, sometimes uh, uh, also can be a bottleneck if you perform a lot of times for this kind of operation. So we use one-side communication, which is another uh, part of the MPI communication, uh, and in that scenario, process. Uh, can perform this kind of reading or writing operation without waiting the target process's uh, participation, which this approach significantly reduced the communication overhead. And next slide. This is a full picture of how we use uh, one, side MP, uh, one side communication of MPIs. Uh, it starts with uh, window creation function, and then we use, a we use a combination of fence and lock, unlock kind of mechanism to, to uh, synchronize the data uh, uh, with minimal overhead. Uh, the, the, this is the overview of how we use those kind of combination of MPI functions. Next slide. So in this, um, uh, this is the beginning of the end zone session. And so we have lined up uh, three types of examples and I will try to guide you through uh, each one of them. Um, uh, for the interest of time, I don't think that we will be able necessarily to um, wait for you to perform the, all the entire training for your uh, uh, using your own machine. And in specifically for the last example, where uh, Jean Gul Choi will show the uh, performance of Hydrogen NN on OLCF Frontier, um, you will have to mostly uh, trust us in the results that we show, because obviously I assume that uh, not all of you have access to the supercomputer. And also there are some uh, job uh, scheduling policies on the supercomputer itself. And therefore, if you um, submit a job right now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be picked up immediately. It depends on the priority of other jobs submitted by other users that uh, utilize the supercomputer as a shared resource. So the first example that we are going to show is the QM9 dataset. So this is a very simple uh, um, computational chemistry dataset available open source. And the reason why we start with this example is because the dataset itself is already available through the PyTorch geometric dataset capabilities. And so there is no need to um, use raw uh, uh, files from the quantum mechanical code because PyTorch geometric uh, already gives you the prepared uh, standardized dataset available. Uh, the original version of QM9 was uh, published in 2014, and it included both graph level as well as node level properties. And here uh, to the right, we describe essentially all the 19 graph level properties that are available through the version of QM9 that can be downloaded automati automatically through PyTorch Geometric. For some reasons that we don't know why, um, the, the version of QM9 available through PyTorch Geometric does not include the partial charge, which out of the original 20 uh, outputs is the only one to be defined at the node level. And so um, for the QM9 dataset, we created two examples. The first one is uh, for single task training, 
so that you can get a little bit acquainted with how to set up the JSON file and how to train Hydrogen NN. And then the second example that we use with the QM9 is for multitask learning. And here, besides taking the data set from PyTorch Geometric, we also download from another directory the partial charge that is available through the original version of QM9. And we will illustrate how uh, hydrogen and N can be used to simultaneously predict all the 20 properties available in the QM9 dataset, the 19 graph level features, as well as the one node level feature represented by the partial charge. And hopefully this will give you a little bit of appreciation about the, uh, the flexibility that hydrogen and N gives you in terms of dealing with um, data of different nature. So for the, for the a single task training, you can go to the um, Hydra GNN um, uh, uh, repository. The website is um, uh, github.com slash ORNL slash Hydra GNN. And once you reach the GitHub repo uh, of, um, uh, on, on the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, you can select the LOG 2023 tutorial branch. And then once you have switched into the LOG 2023 tutorial, uh, we are going to move into examples. And the examples that we are going to show in this uh, tutorial are QM9, LSMS, and CSC. And these three examples are of, increase, of increasing level of difficulties. Uh, QM9 and LSMS, you can e either run on your laptop or on a small scale DGX machine. Whereas Jean Gulchoy will show the last example, which is CSCE, to scale the training of hydrogen and N on millions of atomistic structures using up to thousands of GPUs on the supercomputer. So at the beginning, I will show you um, um, the uh, QM9 dataset. We, at the beginning of the QM9.py Python script, which is inside of the QM9 example, we apply a pre-transformation of the PyTorch geometric data object in order to um, retain out of data.x and data.y only the properties that we are interested in for the single task training. Uh, for the single task training example, the Hydrogen and N takes in input the atomic structure of molecules and predicts as a single output the formation energy. So the formation energy is a scalar graph level property. And so data.y will have a shape equal to one uh, using the nomenclature of a PyTorch. After, so the, this pre-transformation is uh, used as an optional input when uh, we uh, call PyTorch geometric dataset.qm9. And so while we download the data from uh, uh, the remote repository available through PyTorch geometric, we are automatically pre-processing every data sample. And then after the data set has been fully loaded, here, um, since QM9 is relatively small, um, after we execute the line 48, the entire data set resides on the memory of whatever device you're using, um, whether it's a laptop or um, the memory of a GPU or uh, the memory of a compute node of the supercomputer. Uh, we didn't want to make this uh, Python script too complex because QM9 is relatively small in size. So you can very easily fit the entire data set within whatever memory of the computer that you're using. And then um, after we load the entire data set, we, provide, we use the information available in the JSON file to decide essentially how much of the data is going to be used for training, how much for validation, and how much for testing. After we split the data into the three sections of uh, training, validation, and testing, we use the neural network um, section of the JSON file um, to, to create the data loaders. 
And then we pass the JSON file to up hydrogen and N utils update config. And these will update the config file in order to keep track of additional parameters that are uh, um, defined during the pre-processing. For instance, if um, you normalize or standardize the data, we write the information about the scaling values used for the standardization into the JSON file so that in the post-processing, you can rescale back to the original domain um, for every quantity. And then the neural network section of the JSON file, which is this one, is passed in input to the function create model, which creates the hydrogen and N architecture with as many heads as you specify here, and also the type of uh, uh, message passing policy. In this case, we rely on the principal neighborhood aggregation. Once we have done so, we need to wrap the model around DDP, because if you are interested in performing scalable training, you need to make sure that the DDP infrastructure is set up correctly. And this is what the command in line 64 is meant for. We define the optimizers as usual, and then um, as soon as the optimizers and the models are defined, we use the capability train validate test available in hydrogen and N to kick off the training. Now, um, here I show what happens when you want to train, when you want to run this example. Um, this is a, um, a, a Linux terminal. You need to run Python 3 QM9.py. And the very first time that you run this uh, piece of code, it will take some time because if the QM9 dataset is not all already preloaded, uh, pre-downloaded on your machine, you need to download the dataset and that takes, takes a while. Uh, the PyTorch geometric dataset already performs some pre-filtering on the atomistic structures. In fact, the original dataset contains 133,000 molecules, but as you can see here, only 90,000, or a little bit over the 90,000 are processed. If you want to, to know more details about the filtering, we can discuss it offline, but this is the standard pre-filtering performed by PyTorch Geometric. And um, after the data has been uh, downloaded, the training kicks off, and um, we specified in the JSON file that we wanted to run for 200 epochs just to be conservatively sure that the training would converge. And so pretending that we are fast forwarding in time and that we get to the end of the training, um, you can, uh, um, the model is uh, saved with all the diagnostics into a logs directory. So the logs directory doesn't exist at the beginning and it is automatically generated as soon as you kick off the execution of qm9.py. And then if we look at, um, at the content of the log, so we go into examples, qm9 uh, logs, I renamed uh, the logs in as logs a single tasking to avoid overwriting with the second example, which is uh, multitasking. And then here you see, um, uh, for instance, the parity plot of the formation energy, and you also have the error distribution for every data sample. You also have some information about the statistics of the data set itself. Here we plot the number of nodes, meaning the histogram of the number of atoms that you have in each molecular structure. And there are also plots about the loss function, I think, yes. So these are not necessarily as fancy as you would like to put in a paper, but at least uh, these are preliminary diagnostic that you can use whether to see if you're happy with the performance of either N or not. Uh, the second example that I mentioned was uh, for um, multitask learning. So let me go here. As I mentioned earlier, for the multitask learning, we wanted to illustrate the capability not only for the model to predict multiple properties, but also to juggle simultaneously between properties that are graph level and properties that are node level. 
And so if we go into the code, the Python scripts where this is implemented is called QM9 um, underscore custom 20. Here we built our own customized version of the dataset, which inherits from a PyTorch geometric uh, dataset class. And after some uh, import functionalities to download the data, we also uh, download additional files from, uh, um, the, from the web in order to get information about the partial charge, which is the nodal charge we want to use for uh, multitask learning. And then we eventually concatenate, we concatenate the partial charge as an additional node feature into the tensor data.x, which is one of the two main attributes of uh, a PyTorch geometric data object. And then the, once this is done, the main structure of the rest of the uh, Python script is the same as before. So I'm not going too much into the details. Here we define the training validation and portion of the data set. But what I, what I would like to look more into the, um, uh, more in details is the JSON file, because this is where really the user has to provide a lot of uh, input. So for the multitask learning, again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to specify both the architecture for the heads that are dedicated for graph level predictions, but also the architecture uh, for the node level prediction. You are not expected to provide, so if you want to predict 19 properties, you are not expected to duplicate these 19 times. The code will automatically understand through the value provided in the variable of interest, um, which one of the two heads needs to be utilized for every property. And so as you can see here in the line 23, we are assigning equal importance to all the predicted, uh, predicted tasks. And we are using 11 features as input features, meaning that from data.x, we are extracting 11 columns, which will be utilized as inputs. And then for every, for each of the 20 properties that we want to predict, we need to specify whether the property is a graph level property or a node level property. And the string that you specify here will instruct the hydrogen and N code about which one of the two heads has to be created for the specific task at hand. As you can see in our case, node is used only at the very end for the 20th property. Uh, which is the partial charge. Then I will somewhat again fast forward in time and I apologize for that. Um, I already did some preliminary um, training on my uh, laptop. So uh, very similarly to what we did before, now instead of doing Python qm9.py, we run Python qm9 underscore custom.py. This automatically loads the data if uh, um, uh, if you ran the single task training earlier, uh, the presence of the QM9 dataset is already identified, but the code still has to download the partial charge, which is a specifically need for multitasking. And then we kick off the training as before. Uh, the total number of epochs was set up to um, was set up to uh, 50 actually in this case. And then at the end, you can see that the code spits out uh, very basic diagnostics about the amount of time that it took to run the code. And in addition, Pay for this very specific example, decided to print out at the end the root mean square error for, ev for each one of the 20 properties predicted. Again, um, in this case, um, we have uh, 20... Um, uh, 20 parity plots that are generated. And these are uh, for each one of the 20 properties predicted. But uh, what I would like to show you here is actually the 20 plots that pay very judiciously and religiously or already bundled together in a four by five uh, graph. So these are the parity plots of one multi hydrogen and N model that has been trained to predict all the 20 properties. And the partial charge, which is the only node level property is the one at the bottom right. 
Now, I would like to show another example, uh, which is intermediate in terms of difficulty. And this is represented by quantum mechanical data that we generate, that I generated myself running density functional theory calculations on OLC, OLCF supercomputers. I would say that this example is of intermediate complexity because right now uh, we are not relying on preloading the data through PyTorch geometric data set capabilities. We have to create the capabilities to pre-process the data ourselves. Uh, the data set is available open source through Globus. Globus is a very useful app that allows you to uh, download and transfer across multiple endpoints, large volumes of data. So for instance, if you have gigabytes of uh, expensive calculations that you ran on a supercomputer, and then you either want to download it on a DGX machine, or if you want to transfer data across supercomputers, Globus is a, a very good uh, candidate application for that. So the way, um, once you have installed Globus on your machine, and uh, you can use the globus.org website to understand how to do that. Uh, the, this is the typical structure that the uh, Globus interface contains. You have two endpoints. You are going to use one endpoint to specify where the data that you're interested in is located. So for instance, I can say that uh, I wanted to use OLCF DOI downloads, which is the name of the endpoint for the OLCF data constellation. Um, currently, the constellation is under maintenance. However, if it were not under maintenance, now you would have in, on this window a list of uh, data sets that are available. And then on this endpoint, you can specify, for, for instance, I am specifying the laptop because I want to download the data from the source into my own machine to kick off the training. Alternatively, uh, I can also show you, um, if I choose OLCF DTN, this endpoint is uh, used to access the supercomputers of OLCF. In particular, right now, what you're seeing here to the right is the home directory of Summit, which is one of the two supercomputers we have here. And I can also show you that I can access NERSC. Now, um, uh, to the right, you see Summit. To the left, you see Permuter, which are both DOE supercomputing facilities. And uh, using Globus, you can very seamlessly juggle between uh, uh, supercomputers and very easily transfer large volumes of data. The speed at which you download the data is affected by the speed of your network. But the nice property about Globus is that if for some reasons, the data transfer is not completed in one shot, maybe because you lose connection. Uh, when, the data when the data transfer restarts, Globus remembers where the data transfer had stopped before and it restarts from an intermediate stage. So um, essentially this uh, is the name of the endpoint where the DFT data for this example can be found. And assuming that the OLCF data constellation will be back up and working in one week or two, the path here provided in the slides that you also have access to on the LOG website is the specific path where you find the data set for, um, for the downloading. Now, in this example, we I'm going to run three uh, Python scripts. The first Python script is for data pre-processing. The second Python script is to data loading and the training of hydrogen and N. And then I have a third Python script called inference.py, which I am going to use to uh, provide both quantitative and qualitative um, diagnostics about the behavior of the model. Why do I need the compute enthalpy.py? Because the density functional theory code returns the total energy of an atomic structure. But typically, chemists and physicists are not interested in the total energy. They are interested only in a subcomponent of the total energy, which is called the enthalpy. And so 
what I do in my code. Let me show you in PyCharm. And now I move into the LSMS example. The compute enthalpy.py Python script um, um, reads the data from raw files, computes the enthalpy for each one of the uh, data samples provided that are essentially atomistic structures, and then creates a duplicate copy of the data set where the value of the total energy has been replaced with the uh, mixing enthalpy, which is what we wanted to predict. Uh, again, I will fast forward in time a little bit. I already ran this code uh, beforehand. So just running, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to um, download um, the data set through the OLCF data constellation. Once you download the data set, you will have a directory called output files uh, in the example folder. Uh, you have to rename the uh, direct the folder output files with um, iron platinum FEPT, where F and P are in uh, upper cases. Once F the FEPT directory is uh, uh, present in the example folder, the compute enthalpy automatically detects the presence of the of this folder, computes the enthalpy for every atomistic structure, and the duplicate duplicates the new data set into a directory, which is called iron platinum underscore enthalpy. Once you have done this, you are going to move the iron platinum underscore enthalpy um, directory into the data set directory, because this is where I am specifying within the JSON file where the data set can be found. In fact, if I open LSMS JSON, you see that in the dataset section of the JSON file, I say that the data is available in dataset backslash FEPT enthalpy. So here in the JSON file, I'm saying that the first column of data.x is uh, uh, the number of protons of the atom, is essentially the atomic number. <laughs> um, uh, the second, um, then the uh, the column with index number five is the charge density and the column with index number six is the magnetic moment. And uh, all the three properties have dimension equal to one because we treat them as scalars. The magnetic moment as a physical property is a vector, but for ferromagnetic materials, all the vectors are pointing to the same direction. So we can treat the vector as a scalar with no harm. And then we specify that the energy is the only graph feature that we're interested in. And you can access the energy using the index zero of data dot y. Okay, then the data pre-processing is done. You kick off the training for single tasking. In this case, I recommend um, that you uh, use as a, a input argument dash dash input file, and you specify LSMS single tasking.json as JSON file for input parsing, because the default value of input file that you find in the Python script is for multitasking. So if you wanted to use a single tasking, you need to specify the, the specific, the correct name of the input file. And then the, 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 the option pre-only, allows you to pre-process the data from the output of the quantum mechanics code into uh, PyTorch geometric data objects that are then written into, um, into pickle files and the pickle files are saved. Once the uh, command with uh, the option pre-only is completed, you run the same command with the option pickle. And this kicks, kicks off the true training of hydrogen and N here, you know, you see that 70% of the data is used for training and then 15 and 15 respectively for validation and testing. Um, I had set up a total number of 200 epochs. However, um, since uh, I'm using early stopping equal to true, the code automatically detects that after 66 
epochs. There's, uh, hold on just a second. Oh no, sorry. That happens for the multitasking. Yeah. Here it runs for uh, 80 epochs. And after 80 epochs, it understands that additional epochs are very likely not going to benefit anymore the training. And so it stops here. Once you have done so, uh, you can use, uh, again, the same approach as before of looking into the log directory. And this gives you very rough diagnostics about the performance of the model. However, uh, in this case, I want to show you that you can also uh, preload uh, the already trained data set and build some fancier plots in order to make the plots ready for the publication on a manuscript. And you can do so by running inference.py. If you run inference.py after the training, what happens is that the code automatically detects the presence of a pre-trained model in this directory, and it spits out the mean absolute error for the property of interest, in this case, the enthalpy. And this is a quantitative estimate of what's happening in terms of predictive performance, but it also generates a scatter plot. And this scatter plot is a little bit fancier than the one I was showing before. And here we use the additional color the density to show you where most of the data samples have uh, the values within the range. Um, again, uh, you can we can use uh, um, multitasking on this example. And the reason why we want to use multitasking is because if we look at the uh, value of the mixing enthalpy, as a function, um, as a function of the um, of the total magnetic moment, you can see that the total magnetic moment and uh, formation energy are strongly correlated with each other. So the idea would be to um, uh, request that multitask learning takes advantage of this implicit correlation. Uh, to perform a very effective multitask learning where you want where we want total magnetic moment and formation energy to be simultaneously predicted and in addition to formation energy and total magnetic moment we also want the neural network to predict the charge transfer and all these three properties are correlated with each other under the consham equations that is what the dft code um, solves to generate the training data so in this case, you would run um, the second example. Here, differently from before, I'm running the code on a DGX machine. So what happens is that the code automatically detects the presence of general processing units, and it, it uses those processing units for an accelerated hardware, uh, for an, a hardware acceleration of the training. Uh, I am, again, specifically um, indicating that the input file that has to be loaded is LSMS multitasking.json. But for multitasking, you don't necessarily need to do this because this is already the standard value. Um, I am preloading the data. And you need to preload the data again. You cannot reutilize the data as you did for the single task uh, learning, because now there are additional columns in data.x that need to be retained within the data structures. And so you need to perform the preloading another time. Then you kick off the training. And now the early stopping forces the code to interrupt the training after 66 epochs, because it realizes that the validation loss function is not diminishing anymore. And then if you run the Python inference.py script, again, the presence of a pre-trained model is identified, the model is loaded, and both quantitative and qualitative statistics are returned for every property that is predicted. So here you see the mean absolute error for the mixing enthalpy, and then the mean absolute error for the charge density and for the magnetic moment. And when you run the inference.py, the code also produces three parity plots, one for the magnetic moment, one for uh, the charge transfer, 
and one again for the enthalpy as we did before. And as you can see, the architecture that we set up predicts pretty reasonably and pretty accurately all the three quantities that are simultaneously predicted by the code. And now um, this concludes the, uh, the two intermediate um, examples. And I would like to uh, give the opportunity for Jean to describe more in details the training on of hydrogen and N on the exascale supercomputing supercomputer frontier. So I'll go back into full screen and I will go to the very last example. And uh, Jean, please take the stage from here and tell me when you want me to switch slides. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh Okay, so in this final uh, demonstration, we will we will show how we use a uh, large scale data set we named AIC homolumo data set for geometry. Next slide. So again, uh, this code in this example is available through this uh, ROG tutorial branch in our uh, GitHub repository. You can check out by using this Git uh, Git uh, Git command. And specifically, this example is located in hydrogen and example directory, and then CSC. That's the direct, That's the example we are using for, uh, now. Um, again, uh, this uh, this demonstration, uh, we were focusing on how we use the uh, uh, distributed data parallelism with hydrogen and and how we use the DD store. Uh, uh, for this training, and specifically, we will show how we use the distor on Frontier supercomputer machine in ORNL. And also, the because we are using this uh, supercomputer and live demonstration, it is very difficult. So I will show a pre-recorded screenshot, but I will explain the every detailed step. Uh, if and so that you can you can later if you want to try uh, uh try you, if you, you if you want to reproduce it by yourself or in other machine um so main step involved in this demonstration how we pre process the uh, low data and uh, so that we can use for uh, this three data parallelism and then how we use the DD store and how we use how to run hydrogen and uh, training with uh, in, in this fashion. Next slide. So briefly, this is a little bit of uh, uh, background information. What is uh, RNL AIC homolumo data set uh, in this example? So this, uh, this data set is about a uh, uh, large number of graph and we want to predict its uh, corresponding homolumo uh, gap of, of per each graph. And this data set is specifically designed to predict uh, graph level prediction. So we want to predict uh, energy gap of a molecule given their uh, 2D molecular graph structure. The number of molecules in this data set is 10, uh, over 10 million molecules, which is uh, huge. Uh, and then we use the supercomputer and distrib distributed graph uh, neural network training. And and, and and for this example, after checking out, go to the, uh, you need to download your data, uh, download the data for this example. And this data is, the size of data is already big. We cannot include in the GitHub repository, so, but uh, this data is available through this kind of command. So basically you need to go to some our directory and prepare the directory structure and get the data by using the wget command which is about uh, 700 megabyte, 800 megabytes in, in a low data representation. Next slide. So in, in, a, in a typical, uh, and, and then uh, in, a, in a typical way, uh, you, you, you have low data, which is only the described uh, 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 properties of the graph, and then you have to do pre-processing and then uh, convert your low data uh, to in in the form of uh, of the graph graph neural network training. So we are said we are we are using kind of two step approach, and running this uh, large uh, hydrogen and uh, training on frontier uh, or 
supercomputer in ORLL, which require a lot of the kind of the library environment and computing environment and, and contradiction. And so we have set up our hydrogen and development environment on Frontier and we installed on Python environment and we have to uh, build, we built uh, PyTorch and PyG uh, to, prop, to properly utilize the GPUs of the Frontier machines which AMD GPU and we installed the DD store, we installed related uh, library MPI for Pi and RDS library. And those kind of setting up the, those kind of the environment on supercomputer is a little bit uh, need some hands-on and a little bit of the uh, system knowledge. But if you want to, uh, if, you, if you can use Hydra uh, Frontier machine, if you have an account, you can utilize our own environment and by using those kind of command. So uh, we, you can use the module command in, in, in Frontier and you can load our, uh, those, use this command to load our environment uh, to run on the Frontier machine. If you want to set up hydrogen on your local machine or your, your, kind of lock, your own uh, supercomputer machine or cluster, uh, we have the documentation on the hydrogen website to install uh, related library and setting up. Uh, if you have any problem, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, contact us. We can help. Uh, next slide. So this is a little bit of how high level description how you used DD store for your distributed uh, distributed training. Um, so basically, you have the the raw data. In our case, we have the uh, we downloaded the CSE data, and you read the data and convert uh, this raw data into a graph object, which is 5G we are using, and and then and then you connect uh, your your graph object uh, into a into a uh, into a DD store, you need to make a connection with your low data to the DD store, and then the DD store will internally will make will do a kind of registration and provide as a data set, which is uh, the step four. So you you convert your data, uh, low data to the graph object, and the DD store will register, uh, will uh, will help the chunking and registration per process. And then after you're done with the kind of distribution, you can save your this kind of pre-processed data into ADIOS or pickle format. So this is optional, but uh, we are highly recommend uh, since uh, in many cases you have to rerun your cases. You want to you want to uh, Save your pre-processed data for the for the repeating use cases. So now that this is the, now you have the, your data. So uh, and you you register your data in the DD store. So DD store acts as a data set. If you are familiar with the PyTorch environment and, and data related classes in PyTorch is data set and data loader. So this is the data object you register through the DD store act as a data set. Now you have to combine uh, their, your, your, your own or your favorite or default data loader to indicate, uh, to specify you are using the DD store data set. So you, uh, the prop, uh, in, in, in the many cases to, in order to process the distributed data training, uh, we we usually combine distributed data, uh, distributed sampler with the data loader, and then you can you can you can start training in a distributed uh, data parallel fashion um, in in Gen. So now inside inside the DD store, uh, you uh, the get function. That's the function automatically kind of transparently provide uh, data fetching. Uh, not from the file system, it will automatically fetch the data uh, from memory to memory from the uh, in a in a district fashion. Um, and and those are very high level description. But in case you want to customize uh, 
custom customize the DD store to for your own data set. Uh, those are kind of the you can you can customize uh, for your own data. And the in the on the right side on the screen, those are kind of the uh, places you can look at how we how you uh, convert your data, uh, how how you how to use the DD store with your own data. Next slide. Okay, so now let let's talk about a little bit pre-processing step first. Uh, usually in this pre-processing step, you don't you don't need to use GPU. You just the you you have the raw data. You want to convert this raw data into a graph object, which we are using uh, during the, the distributed training. So uh, those are JavaScript. Typically, you can use, uh, you, you, you want to run something on your supercomputer or cluster, you, you have your JavaScript. This is a specific JavaScript you can use on Frontier. And then the, as you can see at the beginning, there is the metadata information uh, to run uh, information to provide to the scheduler and then some environment variable you can specify. This is this environment variable very specific for the frontier environment, but uh, probably also applicable for the other scenario. Now the important is the, the last command. You can see the S run. In this case, in this example, uh, JavaScript I'm showing, you are using two frontier machines. Uh, and and then it, and and we are using six four parallel processes for the pre-processing. So after pre-processing, you can see uh, lots of files saved in the directory. If you can look at the right top side, uh, you can see the configuration file, and you have the raw data which we just downloaded by using the wget command. And then you can see training script, train gap dot file. And after pre-processing, you can see there is a dot bp file, csv gap dot bp and pickle file. Those are two kind of the alpha files. Uh, you can save both or you can choose one of them. But uh, anyhow, uh, in this example, we pre-process the data and save as a adios or a pickle format and so that you can reuse this data uh, if you want to rerun this screen. Next slide. So once you uh, trade, once you're done with the pre-processing, now this is the time to run uh, uh, the real uh, GL hydrogen and training. So the, and again, we are showing the JavaScript and uh, especially let's focusing on the line, command line at the end. So you can see that there is S run and we are, we are, in this example, we are using 32 uh, frontier nodes. And each frontier node, we have eight GPUs, which is the uh, diagram showing on the right side graph, which is the diagram for uh, system architecture per frontier node. So the number of CPUs and the red box represented the num uh, GPUs on the frontier. So anyhow, we are using 32 frontier nodes and we have eight GPUs. So now for this training, we are using total 256 GPUs. And, and this is a command line specifically uh, for frontier using the GPU. So in this example, uh, if you just perform the Python and the train gap script, it will do, it will start training. So in this command line specifically, we are this is just live execution of hydrogen without using the DD store. So in the next, so now I'm in this uh, script. Now we are running hydrogen and training with the DD store. So in this uh, specific script, uh, the training script, we we put an option to switch option to use DD store. Or, 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 or running without the distort. Um, the, the code is very straightforward. I hope uh, you, it is easy to identify how we utilize the distort in the script. So we are not, I'm not showing the uh, uh, every, every line, but uh, this is the option you can, you can follow. Anyhow, 
uh, in this the JavaScript again, we we run we training hydrogen for this uh, CSC uh, AISD homolumbar gap data set with the DD store. You can specify DD store option, and then on the right side uh, we are comparing uh, the kind of very naive high level just kind of work clock time comparison uh, running this training with DD store without DD store. So you can see the time differences, uh, just uh, very uh, simple uh, timing, uh, using the simple timing, uh, we achieved uh, about 5.7 uh, speed up by using the DD store. So the details, are, I'm not showing the very uh, details, but uh, feel free to contact us if you have any problem or to reproduce this result on your side. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, John. And in conclusion, I would just like to briefly summarize the, the what we discussed in the tutorial. Um, we primarily uh, covered the um, our ORNL branded implementation of a hydrogen NN, that, which is available through these um, uh, links uh, um, on the ORNL GitHub repository. It's available open source, and you can also use the QR code at the top right to um, bring the uh, whatever devices you're using to read the QR code to the URNL get, GitHub repo. And we, the way we developed it was starting from day one, keeping in mind all these five core capabilities that I'm showing in this slide that we thought would be extremely important to always maintain and uh, provide to the users to claim that our open source GNN implementation is scalable, flexible in terms of being deployed on very diverse types of uh, problems and also portable to different supercomputing machines because um, different DOE leadership class facilities are very diverse in terms of hardware specifications. And we want to make sure that the scalability that we attain on one supercomputer is a somewhat indicative of also, of also what happens on other diverse supercomputing facilities with different types of hardware. Um, we, we would like to acknowledge both past and present uh, collaborators that uh, did not co-author the tutorial, but that contributed significantly to different uh, capabilities available currently in Hydrogen NN. And, and we would like also to acknowledge our sponsors, the Department of Energy, in particular, the ORNL Artificial Intelligence Initiative, which is part of the Laboratory Directed Research and Development Program at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the SIDAC Institute, under which our collaborators from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory helped us to develop the DD store for very effective, scalable training of graph neural networks on large volumes of data using supercomputing facilities and all the allocations awards that we received both from the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility as well as from the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center and that allowed us also to show some of the results that we illustrated in our hands-on session today. If you have any questions, if you want to collaborate with us and if you want to be part of the Hydrogen NN team and come work with us, uh, feel free to reach out to us through uh, the email addresses available in these uh, slides that are also provided by the organizers of LOG on their website. And I'm looking forward to taking any questions or um, uh, waiting for you to reach out to us. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for a fantastic tutorial. We have two questions so far in the chat. Uh, so the first from Marco, uh, who's also in the room, so I can allow you to unmute as well okay. if you want to ask the question. Um, but in Hydro GNN, do you create your own implementation for different GNN layers, or do you use diff uh, layers from existing libraries, such as PyG? We, we try to rely as much as possible on existing PyG implementations. Um, so we do not develop our own PyTorch geometric uh, message passing. We do not develop the message passing layers from scratch. I'm trying to build, to find the hierarchical structure of uh, just a second here. So um, we, we use existing PNNN implementations from PyTorch Geometric, but the problem that we addressed with HydrogenNN is the fact that 
different convolutional layers or different message passing layers of PyTorch geometric require different types of arguments. So um, if you use brute force, the PyTorch geometric implementation of different message passing layers, uh, the code does not allow you to seamlessly switch between one message passing policy and the other. So you can think of hydrogen and N as um, an intermediate buffer that sits on top of PyTorch geometric and that allows you to enhance the uh, flexibility of the PyTorch geometric interface in such a way that the user can automate the switching from one message passing policy to the other at runtime without making disruptive changes in the code. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Uh, another question is from Bill. Is it possible to take a modified architecture, for example, uh, SCHNet, but with a different convolution or message passing protocol and use HydroGNN? Does that involve something more complicated than modifying the get conf method? Um, so um, in some cases, um, I cannot uh, completely answer this question uh, without having uh, full details in mind about the the Chenet layer. Uh, the Chenet layer is one of the of the co of the um, convolutional layers that that we provide within Hydrogen NN. But I would say that as long as the uh, as long as your customized message passing policy only affects the mathematical formulas that are used to decide how to update the node and the edge features, then um, you can also build up um, auxiliary methods of the message passing class. But I would say that the getConv um, method should be the only one that you, that you should change. Um, maybe um, for um, maintainability purposes, if you realize that the get conv implementation that you're coming up with is very, very long, usually people recommend that you modulate the, the, the method into sub-modules that are called as auxiliary functions. And uh, if you're interested and you, if you want to collaborate, we can definitely help you with that. But um, the only uh, restriction uh, is that you need to respect the existing uh, signature functions of hydrogen and N. So if you look at the get conv um, uh, developed in the base class, uh, the, the base class does not implement the get conv, but it still forces a very specific format and that format has to be maintained. Uh, this is what enables the seamless switch of different message passing layers at runtime. So yes, you can, implement, you can implement your own Chenet layer with your customized variations and, in, and we can help you encapsulate that within this uh, object-oriented framework. Awesome, fantastic. And uh, just to reiterate, the tutorial materials are linked on the blog website. So the contact information and the materials that you saw today, they are all publicly available for you. And I don't believe there are any more questions. So this brings us to the end of the log conference today. So I will see you tomorrow for another day of log. We'll begin with a networking and discussion session. So please join us in Gather Town. All right, thank you and have a wonderful rest.